we're doing it a little different today and bringing you another Q&A episode. We've had some questions come in from our previous Q&A episode, plus some ones that came in recently. We love receiving questions from you. We can't thank you enough for all of your support. And we enjoy the opportunity to interact with each of you. Okay, so this one is actually from a patron. He asks, what are some ways you guys prepare for your job or task? And what are some of the items you take with you to make the job easier? Such as pocket carry tools, comfort stuff, things in general that make things easier. Ooh, that's a multi-layer question because it also depends on kind of what you're working in, right? Right. If you're working in a military shop, I mean, how do you prepare is basically get your maintenance manual out, figure out what you need, mm -hmm. support equipment you need, and uh, sign it all out of the tool crib or, or has cage or wherever you got to go, and then uh, and then make your way out to the aircraft. But um, I would say, you know, so with that, there's minimal things you can you can take with you, right? Because you're limited to so, you know only certain things on the flight line, mm -hmm. or even let's say even in the hangar, um, you might be able to take a drinks out there with you, but you have to have like caps on them, right? So uh, you have to buy those special um, plastic caps for cans or whatever else. But uh, if you're working like AOG on private jets, you're kind of fair game. Um, you can take pretty much anything, everything you can think with you. And um, so it depends, again, depends on the job you're going to go do, right? Do I need to take aircraft you know, jack stands out? Do I need to take, do I need to take the uh, engine change kit with an engine uh, stand? Do I... Am I just going for a simple checklist and I need some buckets, uh, make sure I got oil, hydrofluid, and all that kind of stuff? Um, and then tooling, right? So even with my travel toolbox, um, I have different layers of, uh, of uh, foam cutouts where I've uh, outlined my tools, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, have, I can only fit, I think, five layers in that. Uh, it's a Pelican case, but five layers in that case. But I have more than just five layers. So some layers have specific tools, right? So say for an engine change, um, I would, uh, you know, if I'm going for an engine change, I'll swap out a couple of layers for, for, and put my engine change stuff in there. Or if I'm just going out and doing some general maintenance and a tire change, you know, I'll just leave all the basic standards stuff in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a, a couple of larger sockets or larger wrenches. Or if I'm doing inspections, right? I have a whole whole layer with um, calipers and um, feeler gauges, magnifying glasses, scribes, picks, whatever you want to say. But that's kind of what I do. Um, also, depending on where I'm going, you know, I might take um, drinks and certain food or snacks with me. Right. Especially if I'm going to be working through the middle of the night in kind of a area where maybe there's nothing open late. Yeah. Then uh, I'll take some take some of those comfort foods or whatever with me. Or let's just say you got leftovers from something good. Uh, good, the wife made you at home. Take that with you, so you know at least you got you. You know at least you got a good meal to look forward to. Right. Uh, uh, going real quick to your to your layers, your pelican case. Are all those pre-made? Like you ordered it that way, or did you have to make it yourself? No, I had to make it myself. So uh, the company I was working for at the time, they they bought the foam for mm -hmm. us, um, but that was it. So I ha I went and got some like uh, metal flashing, like you would use uh, doing gutters on your house. Yeah, you yeah. know. Uh, I bought some of that. Got some of that thirteen hundred L yellow adhesive. It's used a lot in interiors on aircraft. Okay. At least on um, you know FAA birds or whatever. But um, and then I glued the foam to that uh, piece of flashing, and then I just cut out. The I laid out all my tools on there. Took a um, silver sharpie. Drew outlined all the tools and then just took a razor blade and cut it out. Nice. So I, I would say like, again, like going back to what you're saying, like you, there's only certain things you can bring to the line if you are able to, or if it's one of those, like kind of like a sign them in or sign them in, sign them out as you go, like certain places yep. they have, like you can pretty much take what you want as long as you sign in everything you got. And that's typically for like, like vendors when they come through, but I mean, it's all fair game to them as long as long as they consider it your tool set or your toolkit. Um, but if I were to say like uh, headlamps is definitely one, 
Um, if you oh, can't, that's a good call. Yeah. If you can bring a multi tool, like say a Gerber or or a Leatherman, if that's even allowed, then by all means, um, like one of those uh, little mag lights, like the small candle light ones. Well, they're not candle light ones anymore, but. The, the, those kind of those kind of ones are ones that can stand on their own so you're not like holding it all stupid <laughs> when you're actually crawling through things yep um well that's a, a, other than the headlamp and uh i would say um like uh different sizes of mirrors like um I, this is actually a thing i've been having to go through a lot is i've been since i've been doing a lot more inspections like well more than usual i have like different like at least a six pack of different size mirrors. <laughs> it's freaking weird. It's crazy, but like having all six of them in my in my pocket or a tool pouch. But it's just it blows my mind. Like how many mirrors I have to use for one given job. Uh, well, yeah, with the mirrors, I mean, um, you know, if you're working in an engine bay, mm-hmm. you know, you can get a bigger mirror in and around there. But sometimes, if you need to get on top of components and and your panels just as big as the component i mean you got to get a small mirror and finagle it around to to look at the top because that's where the connections are at or you know right this and that and you mentioned flashlights or headlamps um with that that's that was a good suggestion because as we all know most of us are working in the middle of the night Mm -hmm. uh outside um i would say bring extra batteries i i've been caught several times not having extra batteries and uh you're sitting there in the middle of a job up in the hellhole of the aircraft and all of a sudden your headlamp just boop, gone. Yeah. You're like, well, this is going to suck. And then you pull out your phone and you're like, well, this is how we're going from here on. Right. The light from my phone, you know? And, uh, yeah. And so that, that's what I would, I would say that. And also, um, uh, plastic scrapers. Ooh, yeah. That's a good one. So maybe if you got, if you're doing maybe, um, you got to pull a panel off and it's sort of a, got a seal on the backside. Sometimes those get, even with all the hardware out, you got to uh, use a little finagling to uh, get that panel off there. So a couple of uh, plastic or phenolic scrapers um, can help you with that. Most dev. Uh, and I would suggest, this is something that I've recently got into is uh, overalls, like uh, <clears throat> like the painters uh, or carpenters overalls, like the old mm-hmm. school ones you got to strap up like the Oshkosh kid. <laughs> um I'm telling you, man, like I used to laugh at that stuff um, growing up, but now like actually getting rolling around and getting dirty on on items that were not issued to me. Uh, those overalls are money because it, it's basically like a pant, like a, a set of pants and some st- extra protection for your for your front side. But like, say, for whatever reason, you got to like get out of it quickly. Just unbuckle the top two straps and it's an off. Off she goes, you know, so. Now the, yeah, I've been I've been using the Tyvek suit. You know what that oh, is? Oh yeah, 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 like yeah. The big one piece. It's real, real thin material. For some reason, though, it still it retains heat like no other. Mm. But um, it's kind of a big you know one piece overall set. It's got the sleeves on it, uh, zips all the way up to your neck, uh, elastic around the uh, the uh, hand and uh, foot holes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I slide nose on. So when you're when you're in you know, on top of or underneath of or whatever, you can just kind of slide one of those on real quick. And then that way you got to, uh, for those of you that have a, uh, half, half desk and half, half on the floor job, you know, you can keep your desk closed still from getting messed up. Yeah. Most def- definitely. I mean, I'm not, uh, I've used Tyvek suits. I've used like the, the painters suit, like the ones you see yeah. at home Depot, same thing. I mean, it's, it's a little less durable, but it, those things are money, especially when you're rolling around and, and that's like the only set of clothes you got. So those are definitely items I would take. And then again, whatever else is authorized um, for your job or for your organization, because a lot of this stuff that we just mentioned, they say, fuck no, here's what you got and yeah. here's what you got to deal with. So <laughs> whatever whatever you can. Oh, also one one other thing is, uh, I don't know if they still make these, but it was like an alligator socket. It looks like a, a regular socket, but it has like these little Allen keys inside it that kind of spring load. And I think it goes up to like a, um, either a three quarters or a half inch socket. But say like you're, you're just kind of do a, a quick job with like a various size nuts or bolts and you only have like, w- like so many sockets. I would definitely get one of those outer alligator sockets if you're able to. 
That way you can fit anything from like a quarter inch up to a half inch. And it's and it's just one socket. So those those are those. Again, it all goes into what's authorized in your area. Okay. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, what is the most expensive tool that you have ever used and how much was it? Oh, my God. Well, let me let me. If you got an answer right away, six, go ahead. And I got to think back through the archives here. <laughs> um, I would say like handheld, like something that's not like ground support equipment or something like the like uh, like specialized specifically for an aircraft. Um, it would be this torque multiplier. Uh, it was made by um, what was it? Uh, Powerdyne. It was made by Powerdyne. So this is just giant block of a torque multiplier. And the, and we use this to torque the the mass nut on a helicopter. This is what keeps the the main rotors from flying off the airplane. Um, and so what? How how this whole thing is set up? This block is about the size of a. Uh, I would say about the size of a of a seven by seven cardboard box, just about. And you would set this thing on the on the mass nut, and this thing's heavy too. It's probably like. 40 pounds or so like but imagine climbing up a pole with with something that heavy in your hand and you're trying not to bang around or or dent anything and then i think this torque multiplier set like it, it can crank up to about 1200 or yeah about 1200 uh foot pounds and you just you set it on the mass nut and then you get this little crank and you just like and you just twist away until you see the little meter hit 1200 or whatever the 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 torque you're going to and you just watch it like just wrench down on whatever it is you're torquing to it's freaking crazy um i want to say that specific tool is about like brand new is probably about like five to six thousand dollars or something like that well that that's like handheld i'm they're not talking like something where like it it has to have its own cart or um uh or it's not like some piece of support equipment that needs like its own maintenance schedule and shit like that right Everything I'm coming up with is like uh, I feel like it's support equipment. I mean, in just, my head. I mean, it's going to fire it off anyway. What was it? <laughs> well, so like uh, service and oxygen or whatever else. Um, you know, and a lot of the bottles you can only get so you can only take the pressure down so far to where you know equalizes to what I mean. It's the same pressure as what you're trying to service to, so the bottle becomes unusable. But you might have 1500 psi left in the left in the bottle that's unusable so they have um boosters mm -hmm. and most of your night carts have them built in and stuff but for for your typical aog guy um it's you, you probably won't have that but used that booster um is probably three to four grand and i want to say they're like six to eight brand new somewhere in there holy shit but basically it just it just forces uh if i remember right it just forces nitrogen or forces pressure down into the bottom of the bottle and then pushes out the remaining like O2 or nitrogen or whatever else you're, you're servicing hmm. from what, from what I remember. But yeah, I remember, I remember seeing that uh, bill for that and I was like, I used one was three to four grand. Holy cow. Yeah. And you'd be amazed too, like how, how expensive some of these parts are for the sizes that they are. I can't, I want to say like, I remember installing these bolts that were probably about like, I don't know, two two to three inches long, and they're like eight hundred dollars each. You know, I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my god, <laughs> right for a bolt, serious? Yeah. But then again, you know, like there's probably like some special tooling and materials and all this and that that go into it so that it's aerodynamic or it doesn't rust or bend or flex or whatever as much. So I can kind of understand, but at the same time, when you see that tag and like and it says over fifty dollars for a bolt. <laughs> you know yeah well a lot of your like um engine mount bolts they're they're you know pretty long there was um there's a bolt i saw oh what was it for i think it was for like connecting the uh wings to the to the, to the spar on the fuselage side yeah i think those bolts are like 900 a piece they were pretty long though they were probably a good 16 inches okay um, but yeah, they were like 900 a piece. I was like, holy cow. Well, well then again, now, that's, go ahead. Then again, that's what's holding the wings onto the plane. So, 
Yeah. But you know, it's just crazy how 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 expensive things can get. Now, as for expensive hand tools, has anybody ever been on a snap on truck? Like you just name it. It's all expensive there. <laughs> right. It's Every, crazy. Everything from if, it, if the tools are delivered on a truck, you know it's gonna be expensive. I think I bought a nice set of snap ring pliers off the snap on truck. And uh, I think if I remember right, those were like, it was like 400 and some change by themselves. Shoo. I mean, yeah, I, was... I remember when I was about to buy myself a uh, snap on set, like this beginner, like level zero uh, mechanic set. And, and it was probably, I don't know, like 150 pieces or something like that. This might have changed, but I just remember that price tag was like over 10 grand. I'm like, oh my God. Are you serious? Know, the box, the, the box alone is like five grand. Yeah, I'm like, oh my god! But then again, you know, like we're we're talking like quality plus warranty plus all the all the extra like protections for these. So I'm like, I can understand. Which is this is why like you see like all these uh shady shop meets sell like used broken ones, and then you just take it to this to the truck and they replace it, no questions asked. <laughs> yep. Now I I learned the other day that. I don't know if NASA still does it, but I learned that NASA for a long time were buying their crew chiefs, whatever toolbox and tools they wanted. Wow. So they were basically putting in a list of uh, what they wanted and then, and then NASA would buy it for them and that box was theirs and theirs alone. So there'd be lots of tools in there, right? That were hardly ever used because you probably aren't going to use it on an aircraft, but like, Hey, somebody else's foot in the bill, you know, I'm going to pick up a set the set of it and uh heck and they yeah. what's that no i was like yeah heck yeah oh yeah so so and then and then let's say you retired you know retired or quit or left or whatever like you got to take that box with you like it was all right here you go nice and <laughs> that'd be a nice retirement gift you get to keep the stuff that you well, like even if you quit even if you're like nah i don't want to work here no more wow you know, they're so like yeah you can take the box with you dang wow <laughs> that is really nice what up with it, NASA? <laughs> well, I, like I said, I, they probably don't do that anymore, but uh, I, I learned that the other day that they used to. Nice. Well, then again, it is NASA, right? Like they're putting things and people in in space. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you look at it anymore, geez, it's not even as often or as efficiently as private companies now. True, true. Still a government entity. They still have their... Uh, drawbacks because of that and all the red tape yeah yeah um okay next question uh what does the aircraft say when you talk to it (laughs) well usually when i talk to it it's usually cursing at it so uh it doesn't say much probably out of fear (laughs) out of fear of being beat i think uh, (laughs) i i think uh some of the i think mine is like it depends on its mood right it's like has like 50 different 50 shades of moods and one day we're like, please just come back and not break. And and it looks me in the eye and goes like, I'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, I'll code through it and I'll do it again. <laughs> Watch me do it again. Oh, come on, man. Just just have a great flight and come back so I can put you in the hangar and go home. <laughs> nope. Well, I do that. I do that. I, I do that like when it's time for to to launch to for a flight. Yeah. You're standing like, please just go, please please, please, please. And you see it start to taxi away and then all of a sudden it slams on the brakes. Yeah, we're going to shut it down, call it a day. Uh, we've got some uh, fault codes. Come on, man. Just like, why? Just just do it one time. Just Keith. go. Just go in the air. <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you really uh, do all that stuff? <laughs> now, if you have a more modern aircraft that you can plug it into it and it tells you what's wrong with it, all you get is a list of... Uh, Codes to say, ouch, I hurt, you know, <laughs> fix me. Right. Oh, man. I remember when um, our helicopter started to get them, they would, they would throw up all sorts of problems. And then some of these were auto, they would auto generate a write up. So we get like a hundred or so of these write ups. And it's just all like all the different fault codes that popped up for every, <clears throat> every, every separate event. So like in some cases, right, you'll get a flight and a fault code will pop up like every time like the wind blows a certain way or you get a slight dip in RPM or some shit like that. So every time it gets one of those incidents or incidents, uh, a fault code will pop up and it'll generate a write up uh, in, into our system once we plug it in. 
So all like this this giant matrix run of cascading write ups. Like, God damn it. <laughs> you know, it's like it's one of those when you open the floodgate to ask someone how they're doing and they just like dump you their story. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> was, not, was not was not prepared for this. this yeah. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, on like some aircraft, you'll have to shake the wing to settle the struts when you're going to service or whatever else. Yeah. Or like say you're coming down off of jack stands and some of the struts they get that stiction so it, it holds itself up a little bit so you shake the wing and then it'll settle itself down. Mm-hmm. So we uh we was doing doing this the other day shaking the wing so it could settle the struts for servicing and then all of a sudden the the avionics tech goes hey we just kicked a fault code for whatever it was and it's like yeah you guys were shaking the aircraft too hard and i just stand there and i was going that little bit of shaking kick the fault code for that and i said yeah they were shaking it too much and i said what the hell happens in flight <laughs> you know like look i know they're hitting turbulence up there and that's probably way more violent than the shaking that th- that guy was doing over there right what what the hell happened you know nobody could explain that one to me either right he- neither the text nor the plane yeah, this kind of reminds me of um, our episode with Coyote, where she's talking about uh, the woman's finesse, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, uh, nothing works on the plane, and then here she comes, or a, or a woman comes and just kind of, like, talks to it all nice, and then it, everything starts to work again. Like, God damn it, <laughs> 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 Fucking plane whisperer. <laughs> Whispering straight into the exhaust pipe. <laughs> work you piece of shit i'll fucking murder you okay just do what i want <laughs> please i know oh my god um okay uh, next other question uh what movie or movies have been the biggest lie about your job oh man Ooh. what was the one for a past job of mine but there's a movie called eagle eye yeah ah, what a crock <laughs> I would what a crock. Uh hmm. <clears throat> like aviation in general, I would say, uh, well, well, Top Gun was fun. It was a great movie. I, I I'm not gonna lie, it was a great movie. Um, but all that the all the things leading up to the action, like where like where Maverick says like he's getting his ass chewed by his CO for like losing his claws and being in hack twice and all this shit. If this were to happen in today's navy, that dude would be gone. You know? <laughs> oh yeah. You know. If you lose your qualms like twice and then you're and you're put in for like to get kicked out of the military twice and even even get put up for it once, that's almost like guarantee your career's over. So I don't know how how like Maverick was even able to stay in the Navy other than uh, if he didn't have like a whole set of black eyes and shit. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. What was another one that they... Oh, what was the uh, that newer <clears throat> the A team? Oh yeah, <laughs> and they're f- and they're falling down. They're flying a tank essentially, and they got all those UAVs flying around and stuff. And they're all they're all jet powered and everything else. And you're like, nah, that, what a bunch of BS. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Or pretty what much a bunch of pretty much any movie where you see like helicopters do off the wall stunts, like like bar- like uh corkscrew rolls and like. All of a sudden, catching themselves like when the rotors are not spinning, like no fucking way. There's no damn way you would die in a flash. <laughs> I mean, like helicopters can do one trick, and that's like a half backflip, and that's about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no freaking way. Or, or like when they're showing, you know, a jet, like a passenger plane or whatever, flying along, and you're like, oh, that's a, and it's an older movie, right? So it might be like an old seven twenty seven. You're like, oh, that's a, you know an old bird and this and that and it cuts to the inside like when they're showing the passengers on the inside and it looks like a 747 that has like lazy boy recliners for chairs and the nicest interior you've ever seen and there's tons of room to move around and and you're just like no 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 that's not that's not how that is right it's a cattle car (laughs) now now one thing that was true was uh iron man where he um like they're in that fancy private plane of his and uh and like a stripper pole comes up from the floor (laughs) 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 at first like no i'm not drinking and then next thing you know like they're getting smashed off of uh, a bottles of sake and shit and the freaking stripper pole comes up from the floor that some planes actually have that (laughs) 
So there was, is it one of the princes of Saudi Arabia? I think his private jet is a seven. Is it a seven forty seven or is it a six seven? Anyways, the inside of that has like, like a whole hot tub and gold everything and like a multiple king size beds uh it's crazy man <clears throat> the interior that was it looked like and what was even crazier is that it was uh architecture of the stuff inside was looked like like uh, greek pillars or old roman pillars you know with the the lions on them like the pantheon and things like that yeah yeah he had like pillars in there that were that were of that decor it was it was crazy Sheebus. Well, when you're the when you're the prince, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess you can you can have whatever you want, but it's just I was kind of thinking like, why do you need, why do you need all this in your jet, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah for real. I mean, because why not? You know, it's one of those like I got too, I got more money than I have ideas. Well, and then I think like in the sh- he had like a full size, a couple of full size bathrooms, but like the one that was private to him, it was like marble showers and floors and. Like a full size uh, toilet and sinks and everything else, and I was just like the weight, the weight and CG. Whoever had to do that for this aircraft, holy shit! Right? Can you imagine filling out that form F? Yeah, like you'd have to account for like, like architectural shit inside a plane that shouldn't be there. Like, god damn it! But then all sorts of additional like plumbing and yeah, for, and then and then a larger waste wall. A larger freshwater tank and then an even larger wastewater tank. Right. The, my, the only thing I would say is, like, whoever did the Wayne CG, either A, like, really, was really good at math, or, like, he just got dumped on, like, a shit ton of money as like, you did not see anything. Like, whatever you say, coach. <laughs> yep. Signing off. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Your, have, a, have a nice flight. It's <laughs> not my problem. <laughs> but then I wonder what all that additional weight changes for servicing requirements. Ooh, right? From your yeah. struts and your... Yeah, tires and your, I don't know. Just buy a new plane, you know, like it lands once and you and just, it just goes straight to the dump. <laughs> like, well, that was one flight. We hard landed and uh, moving on. Right. It's Every like, landing's a hard landing. <laughs> that, <laughs> like, I want a new plane by the time I'm ready to leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I could do that, man. Have more money than I do ideas. I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, I, I can't go any crazier. I put a. <laughs> I mounted a helicopter to the back of my private 747. Right. It's like, I resurrected. Why? Just because I could. Right. I resurrected a dodo bird. I don't know what to do now. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, that's like these uh, big executives. Um, like you heard uh, Bezos is stepping down from uh, Amazon as the CEO. I said, why, why would you want to step away from all? He's like, oh, you know, made my money. I got other things I want to do. Other projects and life goals to, uh, throw my money at man can you imagine that man like you you did so much with your career already there's like you know what i'm i'm, I'm gonna go i'm gonna do a 180 i'm gonna go do something else that, that that's kind of like yeah. where i want to be you know i'll tell you what i wanted to be is his ex-wife <laughs> <laughs> become the wealthiest woman in the world overnight just by getting <laughs> divorced right if they're listening if they're listening we apologize sorry about all that uh but you know it's just the uh Truth and reality of the situation. Right. Okay. Um, so this one's a little bit more on my end. Um, it goes, any advice on how to transition uh, from, from the military to civilian life and how to apply for a federal job that's available for the aviation world? Uh, okay. So military transition, I would say, like, plan your, plan your, plan your, your life ahead, like, two years in advance. Like, don't wait until you're within three, four months of you getting out. I can tell you right now, like if you, if you're if you're not even your wheels are not even turning, like within one year from your time you're leaving, whether it be retirement or whatever, you're well behind the curve already. Um, because there, there's so many programs and and um, like all and um, outreach and resources and stuff like that that you can utilize while you're still in. And a lot of these, I wish I knew about it, like that one episode with Artag, where like, oh, we can, if you just get a big enough class, we'll fly instructors to you and teach you how to fly and get you airline certified and shit. And like, where the hell was this? Like, 
I didn't even know that existed, much less like they would fly instructors to you, right? Well, and like, and like I work on a military base, right? And they say they have those services to uh, help transitioning guys getting out, retiring, whatever else. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's mostly just a poster at that point. But there's like, they don't really, nobody, they they say they have it available, but it's just like a flyer, you know? Yeah. Nobody's, there's nobody really actively helping you. Right. From what I've seen now, I know it's never military, but like I said, I've worked on lots of military installations and and still is am working on a military installation. But that's just even what I see from the civilian side. Yeah. And you're not that far off, man, because a lot of these programs, when like when you've already made the commitment that you're retiring or you're getting out or whatever the case may be, like your service is ending. They will just they'll they'll reach around enough just to shut you up. And then once you've gone through the motions, they could care less. They really could care less. So you got to take it upon yourself for those of you who are listening are about to get out or soon to get out. Like the only one who's going to give a shit about you is you. So if you're within six months of your getting out time, look up skill bridge, look up uh, like uh, US one or like military one source, check up the department of labor uh, there's this other program. It's called Cool. Uh, I forget what the hell it stands for, but it's like DOD wide, and it pretty much takes whatever job you had in the service, and it gives you a list of credentials that match up to your job, is civilian wise, and it gives you a list of certs or licenses that you can get, and then how you can get it, and if your military service already counts for it, and you just need to take a test or some shit like that. So there's different ways that you can go about it and it's and all the information is there is no one plugs it in your head for you to take action. So you got to be the one to self start and take the initiative to find these programs and to really take full advantage cuz once you're out you're out no one gives a shit. It doesn't matter if you're retired or not. Like they really could give a fuck less. Yeah, whether you were <clears throat> a retired general or a retired PFC 1, you know, like yeah. nobody it doesn't matter what, like he said, six, when, once you're, once you're out. Yeah. And then no, uh, ta- go ahead. Sorry. And then as far as like federal jobs go, like for aviation wise, I mean, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Cause if, if your first thought about aviation jobs is the FAA, there's only so much that they have available and it, and the amount, the locations they're at may not be the place you want to go, <laughs> you know? Well, let's face it. It's like trying to get on at UPS. Uh, somebody's got to die or retire. Right. And that, that's another reason. Like a lot of these uh, federal jobs, like it's almost exactly like the military. Like someone has to leave in order for you to come in. And if you're banking on a federal job to be your after service job, just know that there's going to be a pretty long wait time from the time you apply to the time if and when you get hired. Especially if you're retiring. If you're retiring, there's at least a 180-day wait before you can even apply for a federal job. Unless you get a waiver. But how and when to get that waiver, that all depends on the agency and where you're at in your service time. And then if you even got the, qual- the superior qualifications. Uh, I mean, that's the, the key word, superior qualifications for federal jobs. Uh, now there's other stuff like uh, being DCMA, which deals with has it has a side of aviation, and that's more along the lines of inspectors or contractors and engineers and stuff like that. Um, you can also work for the services your your branch of service as a civilian. That all depends on where and what. But again, all, the, the civil service as well. Right, right. Or you can be a the the biggest one that always hires is uh either nurses or for or forest agency. <laughs> or the IRS they're always uh, they're always hiring but again like that that wait that uh that wait time from the time you apply to the time you get hired is very long so you need to have like plans A through Z in case either of those fall out <laughs> so and just like just know like even if you do get sent to the hiring manager you're a dime a dozen so you need to really like strut your stuff as to what makes you the better qualified candidate and if your certifications your time and service and all that is just copy and paste from the next person or just slightly different from the next person chances are you're not getting it shit 
So <laughs> like the more you can prepare now, especially if you're six months, one year away to help you get a federal job, if that's what you're going to go for, you need to start thinking of that now. Cause if you're waiting until the time you get out, it's pretty much, it's pretty much over. <laughs> I, I've always been a big proponent of it's not what you know, it's who, you know, Mm -hmm. so uh coming coming into this from the civilian side um and talking to to you know soon to be veterans or you know still some active duty listeners or whatever else i would you, you're probably if you're working in the aviation uh field you probably are working around civilians uh all day every day on the same <clears throat> on the same platform as you mm -hmm. uh hand in hand and uh, many of those, many of those individuals are probably veterans themselves. But even if they're not, doesn't matter. Um, you're working with these guys every day. Start inquiring about, you know, how they got their job, who they work for, uh, what you know, what they had to do, what licensing they needed to get, um, and then, and then, so when you're going to retire, start, excuse me, applying to those uh, companies, uh, and and a lot of like a at least on the program where I work, uh, a lot of the guys already had the job lined up before they retired. So a lot of them, I guess you guys can save up your leave and like the last, you can take off like the last two months. Mm -hmm. You're still considered active duty, but you're not, you're not showing up to work every day. Right. Is that, that's correct. So, so a lot of guys, they were starting the new job while still being active duty. Right. They mm -hmm. haven't got their, their, um, what you, what's that form he goes? Oh, the DD 214. 214. There you go. Um, they haven't got their 214, so they're still getting paid by the military and by their new job. And and a lot of the guys that they're working with are the same guys they've been working with for the last five, six, seven years, whatever the case may be. Um, it's uh, you know, and then you just show up instead of wearing your your military uniform to work every day, you're showing up in civvy clothes. Mm -hmm. and yeah. so i would say i was and what's what's really interesting right so for for me specifically in my shop we have a, a retired weapons uh specialist and he retired and still all the weapons guys on this platform they they all worked for him right he was their their superior mm -hmm. and now that even he's in the civilian side they still come to him and ask him for advice on how to do things or how they should write stuff or how they should, you know, cause then he left. Right. So the next guy down got promoted, but he's still learning. So he'll still come to, you know, he still gets respected and treated as if he was still there, their CO. It's pretty interesting to, to witness. Um, but that, that's what I would do. And then, and then, so if you've been working with a lot of these civilian guys, I say, Hey, well, what do I need? Well, you, you know, you should get a, a, an A and P license or an airframe and power plant license or whatever else, uh, and get your, um, uh, what the hell is the other certificate for the, uh, like instrumentation. Ooh, damn it. Oh my gosh. I'm drawing a blank. I know uh, I'm failing. I'm failing everybody. <laughs> yeah, me too. Anyways. Um, and then work on getting that and you can say, well, you know, I don't, you know, you, the military would probably pay for the school for you, but, if, let's just say you didn't feel like wasting time doing the school and you wanted to use your, your uh, GI bill for something else. Mm -hmm. uh, have one of those civilian guys you've been working with day in and day out, sign off on your paperwork. And then all you got to do is go take the test. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. If you've been working in the field for, for a long time with somebody who's certified, they just got to buy off on, you know, all you need to do is take the test. Right. And that's what a lot of people do. And that's what I would suggest as well. Right. I highly suggest that. Man, like if you had, there's a way, man, just yeah, network and, and, uh, be good at making friends. That's, that's, uh, what, that's another thing is just be good at making friends. Cause you never know like that, that, uh, that connection might have something that's around the alley of what you're looking for. All right. Uh, this kind of goes into the, to the transition part is like, what's the dumbest thing you've read on a resume? Uh, here I can I can kick that off. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was thinking. <laughs> so so we've uh, so I've, we've seen a lot of veterans uh, get hired in civilian jobs and stuff like that. The one thing that absolutely blows my mind uh, when they give a resume is they list off all their awards, just all of it, like however many it may be, like five, ten, some of them even twenty some awards, right? Like from the time they were brand new to the time they retired. 
um, I'm gonna say this like in the most sincere way, like no one gives a fuck about your awards, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like I remember uh, in our last job that you and I shared, we had this one, we had a position open, and and uh, our supervisor said, "Hey, look over this resume," and his um his description of his job was decent, right? It 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 was very hodgepodge together, but the one thing that really stuck out was he he listed every single one of his awards like every single one like even unit citations like stuff he just gets for just being a part of the team just existing yeah just the existing participation trophy yeah and so, ribbon. and so like i look at it like why is this here why is this here and and i look at my boss and I'm like you're or like like um yeah, are you reading these like well how do you feel about the person first off so i can really tell you how i feel and say so he was like he he didn't really feel it in the resume and they said like well if you look at his awards like he's just like blasting everything he or she has on on his resume like that means nothing you're just shotgunning um like just st like filler you're just shotgunning filler like if you are going to put awards put it for something that actually impacted or made a significance right like you received a a freaking achievement medal or accommodation medal for revamping your your units uh maintenance program or you save someone's life or some shit you know like something that actually like tells the employer that you being there made a big difference right not just like a participation award or some shit like that no one cares so uh, I, like I, i'm i might get flack for this but seriously unless like it's something impactful do not list your freaking awards it, it means no one gives a fuck that you got employee of the fucking month, <laughs> you know? Well, especially, especially um, if it's a non-military person reading your resume. Yes. I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to look at all those awards and go, that's nice. I don't know what it means. Yes. You know what I mean? And then like, and then like six was saying though, he's going, then the guys who are, are veterans looking at it going, this fucking piece of crap. Why is he putting all this stuff on here? Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> so, so from both ends, be it, a veteran or a civilian, the civilian's just going to be, wow, those are a lot of nice words, <laughs> but they mean nothing to me because they don't know. Yeah. And then from a veteran standpoint, they're going, look at this motherfucker trying to church himself up with his participation <laughs> ribbons. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just, so, yeah. So I would agree with six on that. Like uh, less is more in some regards. Yeah. Now, from my end, it kind of ties with the awards thing too. I saw a guy who had a, who submitted a resume and he had awards on there that he had received in high school. Like, uh, he was, uh, what the hell was it? It was like the honor something society president. I, I was like, well, that's nice, but we're in our, you're in your thirties. And, uh, I don't see how that applies to here. Right. <laughs> like it's nice if you're applying to college and you're 18. Great. Fun. <laughs> but you're applying to a maintainer's position at such and such company. Like I just, why? Like you should have worked on, but that you, know, you have the awards listed there. Right. And then you look at under like work experience, um, maintainer on such and such platform for two years. Okay. Uh, did you do anything else while you're there? No, I just worked on the, worked on the jet. Did were you a part of any uh, anything major? Any big milestones? Did you help write a new policy or procedure that changed the way things are done for the better? Were you? Uh, did you do anything of note? You know, noteworthy. And like, oh, well, I mean, nothing I can think of right now. You're like, okay, well, I think we're done here. Right now, but yeah. on another resume. Sorry to me cut you off. Six nice. um, on another resume. Another thing I would say is be mindful of where you're applying because, and I say this because the aviation community is very small. A lot of us, and if you're like somebody like me, who's uh, moved around quite a bit and all within a similar area, um, you, you know, you get to know a lot of people, but you learn that other people move around too from company to company to company. And so when you're applying, you make sure what you're putting on your resume is, is factual. So, like, for example, we had a guy who was a supervisor of mine in a past job, and he applied to where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. And it said, 
uh, you know, was director of maintenance. And so, you know, the maintenance uh, shop calls me down. They're like, hey, man, uh, we know you worked here. You know this person? Yeah. Hey, read over this. Okay. Director of maintenance. That's that's not even close. Why would you <laughs> put that on there? You know what I mean? And and, and then I started thinking back. I'm like, oh, because the DOM one time said, hey, I have to go to a more important meeting. I need you to run the daily or whatever it was. or Or update this Excel spreadsheet for me. So people take a lot of liberties, right? If, like, let's say the colonel asks you, hey, man, I need you to film this for this meeting today. And people go, oh, perform colonel duties uh, on numerous occasions or filled in for colonel when colonel was out or filled in for DOM when DOM is like, no, nah, not not really. You're you're really stretching the uh, what they asked you to do. Right. And so so just be be mindful of that if you're putting it on there make sure you put on there the truth because somebody out there is probably going to be looking at your resume going that's that's a lie right now like they were barely able to function as a supervisor let alone yeah matter of fact uh matter of fact one of uh one of our friends from a previous job was a quality inspector and she mentioned that she saw this one resume come through to be saying that oh she was a an applicant was a quality inspector i'm like that uh, at this company i'm like that doesn't sound right because i'm like the only person here that's an inspector with this kind of role so i mean like that doesn't sound that doesn't sound right and and uh ended up digging through and found out that this person was not in was not a quality inspector but was a documentation specialist but somehow understood it that since they are screening uh, documents for accuracy and and whatnot that that counts as being a quality inspector. So I mean, I guess, I guess because you know documentation is is a pretty big deal in the aviation realm. But to flat out say like, oh, I'm a quality inspector, that's well, that's that's stretching the truth quite a bit. <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, well, we're, like we're a documentation specialist, so we're looking through the forms and uh, we're verifying that everything's good. Yeah. You are, and so am I, as the actual quality inspector. Yeah. And I can name on all my hands and toes, fingers and toes, the times that I find the stuff that you supposedly said you already you already scanned through the book for. Right. And didn't <laughs> find any errors. And here I come at you, and I, it looks like I murdered the book because there's so much red ink all over it from the shit that I found. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, and that goes, man, like if, when you're doing your resume, if, if uh, you're kind of dry on the experience, start listing skill sets instead, right? Like there's so many different ways you can, you can paint a resume. And if your experience is a little shy, start highlighting what you can do, like what you're capable of, not just what you did, you know, like, like say like, Oh, I'm a problem solver. Okay. How are you a problem solver? Like, well, back in this one time, like we needed to shorten time for whatever reason. And I, and I helped them come up with a solution, right? Whether you were the one who was directly responsible for it is a different uh, answer. But the fact is you were engaged, you tried, right? Like you're demonstrating a skill that you said you have something, right? Yeah. Save the program uh, X amount of money by um, removing inadequate tooling and, and provide and brought in um, better, better tooling or whatever else, which saved, uh, you know, it was an initial expense, but overall saved the job went from five hours to two. Yeah. With this new equipment type thing, so, stuff like that. So people can say, oh, wow. OK, so so, you know, you're you're looking to better the program. So you're one of those people. You're always looking for for uh, how to better things. Yeah. Right. But also got to be careful with that, too, because that can come back and bite you in the ass. It's how all and how you approach it, too, because if you're one of those like, hey, we should change this and change that and change it. Well, upper management of that program is going to start taking offense because you're going to go, this motherfucker don't think we can run it. Yeah. So y'all, you're, you're also yeah. going to be careful on that end too. Yeah. Or and then the flip be, side, be you're, one of those people. Choose your hill to die on. Don't don't try to die on every hill you come to. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, two more questions. Uh, should engineers be required to have refresher training like mechanics and pilots? Uh, short answer. Uh, I'll let you answer first. Um, I don't know about refresher training, but definitely being down there and working hand in hand. Yes, I fully believe they should be. They shouldn't, I, they shouldn't just like, well, my, my drawing on my computer says, well, I don't give a shit what it says. I'm telling you what's, what the physical asset is. Yeah. So bring your chubby ass down here 
<laughs> and let me show you what's up now you do have like you know i've worked with some really awesome engineers that they they they're out there on the floor probably just as much as the maintainers are right mm -hmm. especially if it's a project that they're working they they they're heavily involved but on the other end of the spectrum i've you know engineers are like oh well um the computer says this i'll email you this stuff and i'll update the whatever when i can get it get to it what like and then they don't answer their phone they don't answer their emails their skype their whatever you know Mm -hmm. like they're ghosts they just show up whenever they want to and then disappear yep no no i would say uh depending on what kind of engineer we're talking about right then then yes right because i don't know how some people's brains work but i i doubt a dumb math like it's freaking cool <laughs> you know and or or especially like if it's a different kind of system like like uh cad drawings or uh like uh visual work instructions like the stuff you can like uh take a like an electronic pen and then draw kind or like make all kinds of stuff to so make it easier for the mechanic or the technician to work on right um i would say that they should get refreshed especially now that everyone's uh working from home and starting to come back into work like um that's gonna be quite a shock for some people because they got used to being at home and doing things how they saw it so like having some kind of like back in the saddle um refresher to have them get used to that dynamic again maybe or like some kind of cert that like what quality assurance goes through like they're not doing the maintenance but they at least have an idea or they get refreshed on the idea of how it works every so often like say for uh like uh, confined spaces um engine run certs um egress certs stuff like that like we know you're not touching it but we're kind of giving you this reiteration, so you kind of under you can kind of remember the gravity of all of all this. Oh yeah, fam training. Like when you're up inside the cockpit, these are all the no-no buttons, you know. Right, and they're usually marked in red or or yellow, so <laughs> don't fuck with these. And the reason why, and the reason why I think this question is valid is because um, there are a lot of times engineers will just get so used to their bubble. Like you, what you were alluding to, MVP, where like they're they're horse blinders and they don't see anything outside of their drawings or their computers, especially now, especially a lot of them who are working from home. So, uh, if you're just so used to just that, and you're do and you don't realize that the aircraft exists outside of you, and sometimes what you put on paper doesn't match up to the physical aircraft itself, this could lead into an incident, right? Like. Uh, this doesn't fit or this uh it doesn't put out enough pressure it puts out too much pressure the software is not kicking off what it's supposed to stuff like that and next thing you know like the aileron slams shut smashes somebody's hand or the engine like uh runs too hot or doesn't shut off when it's supposed to so it smokes everything stuff like that and this is all extreme but it can lead to that so i can well i even had an instance where <clears throat> the engineer had never seen the aircraft before right yeah all you'd only ever seen drawings and so he designed this uh, pod or whatever it was going to be, this fairing that was going to be mounted to the uh, belly center line. Mm -hmm. But when they sent the, the fairing up for us to mount it, the mount holes were two inches off to uh, one side or the other. I don't remember which side it was, but you know, two inches off left or right. Like, Hey, this doesn't, this doesn't fit. doesn't work. Um, it's off center. And through again, V email. No, no, no. I did all this. It's right. This and this and that. Blah blah blah. The you know mount it, and we're taking pictures and back. It doesn't fit. It physically can't be mounted in its current setup. Like redo. And so, so eventually, after numer like a week or so of going back and forth, he finally decided to drive up and figure out what's going on. But I remember him walking the hangar, going, "Huh? So that's what the airplane looks like." And you're going, you, "Wait, you've never seen it? Like, hold up. <laughs> no, only in drawings. And but as it turns out." Somebody before him fat fingered a number onto the into the uh, drawing, mm. and so he was taking his measurements and his design off of somebody who you know a human error, right? But that just goes to show you, like, uh, without being there and on site, you know, it's hard to uh, it's hard to uh, to know if you're just going off of drawings. But that's another thing. Like, it's like, no, you guys are. I've had other instances. No, you guys are making this up. Why in God's name would I make this up? What do I have to personally gain from lying about a fairing being 
off by two inches. Right. What do, what do I get out of this? There's no, there's no personal gain for me. There's no reason to lie. Right. Like, so, um, I would, you know, there's instances like that. And then recently, um, I would say cross training is another big thing. What engineering should be doing, especially if your organization's not big enough or doesn't want to pay a system specialist, you know, for each, each system on the, on the vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, we had engineer, you know, we had to do a composite repair on a, uh, how was it? Uh, landing gear door, I think. Anyways, I had to do a composite repair, but it was only the damage was only two ply deep, and it was uh, no more than uh, like a dime in diameter. Mm-hmm. So not that bad. But the repair they had, which was from another aircraft that they just kind of used, and like, hey, instead of us writing something else, you can just do this. But it had them doing a plug, so cutting out a nine inch area and then filling in with a plug. We're like, hey, that's a whole awful lot of extra work for something that's not that serious. We can just do wrap around plies. Mm-hmm. And the engineer was like, "I don't, I don't get it." And so we brought him down to the floor. I'm like, "Hey, look, here's what you got to do." We spent 20 minutes explaining to this guy <laughs> how to do the wraparound ply repair, and he finally stops and goes, "Look, fellas, um, I'm going to be honest. I know nothing about composites. Okay." He goes, "I'm learning a lot from you guys right now." He's like, "That's why I've been letting you talk for so long." He's like, "But I know nothing of composites." And I was like, "Do we have a composite structures guy here?" "Nope, only me." <sighs> Fun. He's right. like, but I'm not comfortable with rewriting it and this and that because I don't know. So continue with the repair as uh, somebody else had written up in the past. Damn, really? Okay. Damn. Yeah, that's, and that's exactly what happened. I was like, holy cow. At least do some, they need to do some cross training, especially if we're not going to have one of each on site. There's got to be, and I get it, right? That's expensive to pay, you know, an engineer 120 thou a year and have and have 10 of them on hand per shift. You know, I get it, budgets and everything else, but there needs to be some some cross training, some fam training, some whatever. So no matter what issue arises, they have at least a little bit of an understanding. Right. Uh, <coughs> All righty. Last question. Uh, best advice for future mechanics. I think we kind of been hitting the nail on the, on the head on that for some time now. Uh, I would yeah. say, I would say for if you're a, you're an aspiring mechanic. Um. It, it is what you're comfortable with. If you're the kind of person who likes to just get the schooling done and, and you have the budget to do so, by all means, um, you will learn a lot in school. Uh, some of which may or may not apply to what you're actually going to do. But if you have zero knowledge about maintenance in general or zero knowledge about aviation, a school is a good way to go. Right. Again, if you have the, the budget to do so, because some of these schools, they're about uh, an associate's degrees worth in length in some cases. Um, it always uh, be willing to learn. Like, even if you have no idea what this job is, if there's someone there who knows what they're doing, tag along with them. Uh, That's the only way you're going to absorb knowledge. That's the only way you're going to make yourself better. And the more uh, skills uh, you can add to your bucket, the more likely you're going to be able to stick around, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And don't come in expecting that, you know, and demanding, I want, I want to work days only and I want, you know, and I want to work only these hours and I only want to do this job. You know, I don't want to do anything that has to do with fuel and I, I only want to do this specific thing and I only want to be involved in launch and recoveries or whatever else. Like, you know, you're going to set a negative tone of mm-hmm. yourself right away. And then if I know most maintainers, uh, they're going to, oh, you don't want to do that? Guess what you're doing every time now. Right. Hey everybody, this guy's changing out all the fuel components from here on out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, so come in uh don't come in uh demanding the world because uh uh maintainers will uh will cut you to shreds. Yep. And by every and they'll and they'll laugh the entire time while doing it. Absolutely. Because let's face it, they're hating life and, and making yours worse is uh makes them feel better <laughs> <laughs> it's like making someone else's life darker is what makes mine brighter <laughs> right? uh, i would also say like oh like you kind of have to be a, a forecaster like um or um almost like uh be able to see ahead because um as things evolve as things uh get changed upgraded or whatever if you're starting to learn all this stuff like 
as it happens, the less likely you're going to become obsolete because you would have, you would, there's a good amount of mechanics out there and technicians that they're so set in their ways. Like they absolutely refuse change. They're totally abrasive to change. They, they fight it a lot, every tooth and nail because like, this is how we've always done it. Air quote, this is how we've always done it. And those would be one of the first ones to go. So though, don't paint yourself into that corner and start don't don't focus too hard on on the future when it's not even there yet but just kind of be cognizant and have that uh, as a sensitive awareness because when it does drop it's gonna that learning curve is gonna be 90 degrees and you're gonna ex be expected to know it like within a powerpoint slides worth of time uh you know what to add to that i would i would say uh best advice i can give right now for maintainers is learn computer programs get real savvy with computers mm -hmm. i mean even from from learning how all the extents of what your outlook email is capable of but get comfortable with excel pdf you know word and all these programs have multiple things they can do powerpoint um many as as we've alluded in other episodes but many programs now are operating on on uh, paperless documentation systems learn that system to a fault mm -hmm. you're just going to make yourself so much more valuable if you if you're one who can understand how to navigate navigate computers and and these programs and everything else i mean you're you're going to also excel yourself and they'll probably put you into a, a lead role pretty quick because i mean yeah it's important to learn the aircraft and how to work it and everything else but but working on the assets as we've said is only half the job the other half is all all paperwork computer work whatever else so um get real savvy with computers don't don't do what i've done i i'm not uh very savvy i i'm enough to be dangerous but i'm not <laughs> I'm not great by any any stretch of the word so get really good with that take some computer pro, pro uh programming classes if you want to or at least learn like how to do c plus that way, if the system tanks or whatever, you, you kind of understand how to do recovery methods. Like we have a guy in our shop and um, our uh, inspector tracking system tanked the other day and there was a bunch of data on there like, holy shit, we don't know how to get it back. And the guy three hours later come back and say, hey, I was actually able to find and recover everything. So I'm like, holy cow, how'd you do? He's like, ah, it's a, it took me a long time. It's a lot to explain. We're like, all right, another time you can explain it. But we're just really glad you got the information back. So, yeah. So get real savvy with it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the best advice I can give for a lot of up and coming or current maintainers. Yeah, most definitely. Nail on the head. Thanks for that. So, well, that's our questions and answers for today. Uh, thank you all so much for sending all these in. And again, we love getting these from you. Uh, if you have any other questions or some topics you would like to send us send our way, uh, you can send it through either social media on Facebook or Instagram. Or you can send it to our contact us on our website at cancelformaintenance.com. We love getting these questions. We love interacting with you guys. And all this information is really just from our experiences and, and shared stories from other mechanics from all the walks of life we have seen. And this is all stuff to get passed on to you so you don't make the exact same mistakes as the, the, the ones before you. Right. Learn from the clowns. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Learn from the clowns. <laughs> All righty. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Uh, happy Father's Day to the, the listeners out there who are dads. Happy Father's Day. We'd like to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to keep producing episodes, bring on guests, and keep Shoreline ever to happy to produce our show. With special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Stephanie Boltman, Jenny Dignan, Ryan Frushauer, Daniel Schubert, and Steven Shivers. Thank you all, our patrons, so much for all your support and, again, your patronage. If you have ideas, topics, or stories for the show, or you would like to be a guest on the show, visit cancelformaintenance.com and drop us a line on our Contact Us section. We will do whatever we can to get you and or your ideas onto the show. Check out our sponsor, Rockwell Time, for all sorts of outdoors and sporting apparel such as watches, safety rated sunglasses, and snowboarding goods. Visit rockwelltime.com, use code CX4MX, and save 10% off your purchases. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash cancel for maintenance. 
Patronage again allows us to continue making episodes and maintain our gear. Patrons also get exclusive perks such as access to our Discord and discounts to our upcoming merch.